Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Um, this is a cool day. It's a day when we celebrate love and what the impact of being loved and finding someone to love. And um, that seems very fitting, considering that we're going to consider Jesus and his impact on us. So we're doing a series right now. We're looking at the book of John and um, encounters that people had with Jesus and how those encounters led them to a more abundant life. That's basically the overview of it. And John began to talk about that abundant life last week at the end of the sermon, and we're going to continue. And if you have a Bible, we're going to look at a particular encounter in John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. And um, it's an encounter where a guy uh, comes to Jesus in need, but Jesus challenges him to have a deeper kind of level of trust, and in doing so, he finds um, some abundant life. So let me open up my Bible here and We'll read that passage together. <clears throat> All right, John four forty six. Once more, he visited Cana and Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him, and he begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. And the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replied, You may go, your son will live. And the man took Jesus at his word, and he departed. And while he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. And then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and all of his household believed. And this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. Lord, um, meet us in this text. Uh, speak to us where we're at today. Um, you are alive and you are with us, and you want to guide us into a deeper life. So um, show us what that life can look like with you. We love you. Amen. Um, this is a, a gripping story. Uh, it says that the man lived in Capernaum, and um, his son has a fever, and it is not going away. It said he was a high uh, official, and so this is a well-resourced, very on top of his life, uh, well-connected man, and he encountered something that absolutely um, there wasn't a solution for. It was a crisis, uh, and nothing was helping his son get better. And it's interesting to me that um, this guy uh, would leave his son, who was, who was there <laughs> dying. I mean, and, and over what? This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is, um, he might have heard a rumor that there was this guy, Jesus, who could heal the sick. And he has to make a decision to walk away uh, from his son and, and reach out to this Jesus and see if he'll do something for him. It's a 15-mile journey between those two places. And I imagine that is a long three to four-hour journey for this man. Um, and um, I don't know about you, but that's how, how I came to Christ, was in the middle of a crisis. I mean, life was not going well for me. It seemed to be going more and more downhill, and I didn't know where to turn. And um, so I reached out kind of on a hope and a prayer, sort of a Hail Mary shot. Uh, maybe this Jesus has something for me. Um, and I know others of you have walked with the Lord a very, very long time and maybe came to Christ more gently. Uh, you found this Jesus and, and he had something for you and so you added him to your life and, um, and found that he wore well over the, over the time. Um, one of the tricks, um, I think, for this this man as well as for me, as I came to faith, and maybe for you in your story, is um, when I came to faith, uh, Jesus was something I wanted to add to my life because I thought it might help. Um, and it, 
was sort of a, a condiment, and I've kind of coined this term condiment faith, um, which I kind of titled the sermon around it, because um, my intention when I came to the Lord was not to uh, give my life to him. It was to have Jesus uh, be an add-on to my life that would make it better. And when you think about a condiment, like my favorite burger joint, I love burgers, by the way, if you know a good joint, I will go there with you because I want to try out another burger. Um, my favorite place right now is Blazing Onion, and they have this sauce called Bob Sauce, which I'm pretty sure is just ketchup and mayonnaise stirred together with some pepper flakes, so it adds a little zip to it. Uh, I could be wrong. And as much as I love that sauce, though, I would never go in and be like, can I just get a bowl of Bob Sauce and a spoon? I mean, you just wouldn't do that. It, it always goes with something else, and I think sometimes that's how we kind of come to Jesus, and I notice I do it in and out of my life is in different areas. I go, man, you know, I want to add Jesus to this thing in my life, in this plan in my life. Um, and I think most people can have that sort of faith. Uh, I, I recently read that 20% of atheists and agnostics actually pray. Well, I don't even know if you're there, God, or if you are real, but I'll pray because it'll help. It's sort of like the condiment prayer, like, come on, God, I know I have to manage my life, but you can uh, maybe do something, so I might as well. Um, condiment faith is easy. It's easy to have Jesus be the salt on your fries. Um, but that won't actually change the trajectory of your life. And uh, I think Jesus has something better in mind. And so um, I kind of see this guy coming to Jesus. His son is really sick. And uh, Jesus, he has a plan for Jesus. I'm going to go to this guy. I'm going to get to him, and then I'm going to tell him that he needs to come down with me, and I'm going to drag him along, and maybe a crowd will come, maybe not, and um, and they will, uh, and then he'll he'll touch this son of mine, and he'll be healed. And the crowd kind of has a plan for Jesus too. They're sitting there going, "This guy, Jesus, he's getting steam. He seems to do some cool stuff. Let's go see what he's going to do next." And um, they want to see a show. They want to see another miracle because this is exciting times. I mean, Jesus has shown up and he's doing some really neat stuff. And, um, and at the heart of this, they both have a condiment faith. They both are looking for God to do what they want him to do. Um, and Jesus pushes back on it and says, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to have faith on a different level. I'm going to ask you to um, trust and obey and let me do what I want to do. And that is at the crux of this difference of faith. And Charles Spurgeon, uh, a famous preacher, said, I recommend that you either believe in Jesus to the hilt or not believe in him at all. Believe this book of God and every letter in it or else reject it. There's no logical standing space between the two. Be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the deeps of divine revelation. Because a faith that paddles up the shore is poor at best. It's little better than dry land faith. It's not good for much. Um, and what he was talking about was this abundant life that Christ wants to give us is not going to be found if we're just simply inviting God to kind of come along and supplement the things that we want to do. Um, there's this other life, a spirit-led life, where God guides us and where we are becoming a part of what he wants to do instead of him becoming a part of what we want. Is Jesus the condiment, or is he the center? I wish I could say that on that time when I came to Christ, I gave my life to Christ, and um, I believed to the hilt, and ever since then, I have sacrificed everything to the Lord and simply uh, submitted to his will at every moment. Um, but you all know that that's just plain silly. Uh, there are moments when I do that, and things go incredibly well when I do that. And then I, for some reason, seem to take things back and then go, okay, God, I want you to do this. Um, here, come with me on this journey. And the, the biggest times of struggle in my faith that I can think of um, are from times when I've had a plan for God and God has not managed to come through with what I thought he should do. Um, there was a time when I had a... Uh, college girlfriend, and I was going to move to Arizona, and I had this whole plan set up. So I was going to marry this girl, and her dad was a college pastor, and I loved doing college ministry, so I was going to work with him. And I could see how God could use my gifts 
for the next five to ten years in a really beautiful way, and um, that it was going to be amazing. And I went down there, and uh, the girl and I broke up. I didn't get the college ministry job, and it was a very, very hard time in my faith. And as I look back on it, I realized the hard time in my faith was because I didn't leave the results up to God. My plan was not to go, okay, I'll take the next step with you, God, and then see what you want to do. My plan was, God, why didn't you come to me? Um, and this, this happens to this guy. He, he comes, um, and, and condiment faith doesn't face those kinds of hardships well. Uh, it, it sort of goes, God, where were you? And this guy shows up, and he, he's coming to beg Jesus. He just left his son who's uh, on his deathbed, none of the doctors seem to be able to heal him, and he shows up, and he says, Jesus, come down and heal me, heal my son. And um, Jesus says, well, unless you people see signs and wonders, you're never going to believe in me. That is not a good start to a getting Jesus to come with him. Um, but he presses on, and he says, come down before my child dies. And... Jesus' response doesn't fit his plan. It's, go, your son will live. And at this point, when we're reading scriptures, we have a tendency to jump to the next verse. And I want to stop for a moment, kind of sit in his shoes in that moment. Because at this point, he has to make a decision. This is early on in Jesus' ministry. There's no precedent for somebody healing somebody from 15 miles away. And he has this guy who he's never met, but he trusts can maybe heal his son, and he has to make a decision. Am I going to trust what this Jesus says, or am I going to try and convince him to come down with me, because I have a plan? And um, I don't imagine that that was an easy shift, and every time I've had to make that shift in my own faith, in my own life, to saying, God, your will be done, not mine, it's not necessarily an easy flip of a switch. And the Bible makes it feel really easy when you just skip to the next verse and go, oh yeah, of course, he went down happy, tried to Jesus at his word, probably threw confetti behind him as he was going home, going, oh, Jesus said he's going to be healed. It's all good now. Um, <laughs> it's not how faith works. But he chose to make a committed faith. Um, and in, in that commitment to say, I'm going to take Jesus at his word, um, he began to head home. Now, he heads home alone. Um, one interesting detail is that it says that the next day, uh, his servants met him on the road. And that means that he had an evening in between there. Um, so, this was one o'clock in the afternoon uh, when Jesus said, your son will live, and yet the next day is when he made it home. So, he had obviously stayed the night in Galilee, headed back the next morning, and in that evening, I can imagine him laying in his bed going, what's God going to do? <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, I hope. I take Jesus at his word. I trust him. Uh, none of the other doctors at home were able to do anything. Um, what will I do if my son doesn't make it? I mean, this is, this is a struggle. And um, we live in the in-betweens of a lot of our faith, don't we? God doesn't give us the answers. We, we pray for clarity. We pray for vision. We pray for uh, good things to happen, and they don't always happen just like that. Um, we sit in the in-between while we wait for what God is going to do, and we try to trust him, we try to obey him, and we try to leave the resolution to things in his hands. Um, and it's, it's a dark night of the soul um, to trust God in that moment. But I think that's when our faith gets deeper. I know for me and my story, in Arizona, that was a year when God worked on me in a, an amazing way and taught me what it was to just be his, to be loved, and to do that without ministry, and to do that without a girlfriend. And so um, God can do some amazing work in the in-betweens. Mother Teresa um, has uh, had a mission in Calcutta, and... Uh, that mission continues on, but lots of people will go there. They kind of come from all sorts of faith backgrounds, but they'll go down there to serve. And she's uh, met one 20 year old young man who had come down there, and uh, she asked him why he had come. And he said, You know, I've, I've come because I don't know what to do with my life. <coughs> and she said, Well, how can I pray for you? And he said, Well, you, 
pray for clarity for me, that I would know what to do with my career. And she said, no, I won't. <coughs> I will not pray for clarity for you. Instead, I will pray that you will learn to trust even when you don't have clarity. Um, and that is where faith happens. She's a wise, wise woman in that. Um, it's another step of faith. And rather than just asking God to come with us to say, God, not my will, but yours be done. I'll take you at your word. Um, and if we do that, our faith can shift from uh, this condiment faith where we ask God to come along to a faith where we say, God, I just want to be a part of your story. And where we recognize that God is doing things all around us to bring abundant life into the world and we get to join in in some little way. And when we do that, we experience the best possible life that God has for us. Um, and there's something else that happens uh, when we catch that fire and when we get excited about uh, what God is doing. And that is that it has a tendency to get catchy. Not like my flu, John's flu. Not that kind of catchy, but a different sort of catchy. Uh, this man was on his way home uh, the next day and um, he shares his story with his household. You know, I, I ran across Jesus and he said, you know, go home. And and so I trusted him and I, and I headed home. And then the servants go, wow, well, you know, that fever that wouldn't break broke at the exact same time. And as they shared their stories together, um, they realized that there's something about this Jesus. And it says um, in verse 53 that he and his whole household believed. And that is when they came to faith. Um, it wasn't that this guy trusted Jesus with his life before that. Verse 53 he and his whole household believed. It's actually the first recording of an entire family coming to faith in Jesus. Um, it's a very, very powerful moment for them both when they realize that Jesus is the one. And um, that is what happens when we begin to trust our lives with Jesus, submit our will to his, and then share the story with other people. And, and they get caught up in the excitement of our faith. Because we're just sharing our stories, and they're sharing their stories. And, and in that intermingling, God does stuff. Um, and that's my hope and my prayer for my life and for this church, is that we'll be a church that can submit our will, say, God, you come in, do what you want, and then we'll share the story with people around us, and they can encounter Jesus through it. Um, the world needs people who will trust themselves in God's hands. And the world needs people who will trust themselves in God's hands and then share the story. And uh, they'll get caught up in it. Um, now, easier said than done. Trust and obey, right? Yeah. So, now the YBH. Yeah, but how? It's Lent. Exciting. Uh, we have a couple months until Easter, two months till Easter. It's a time when we often give stuff up. Uh, I have not chosen anything to give up. I guess I'm giving up being healthy for a short time here. Um, no, but but this sermon kind of kind of kicked me in the tail and said, what would it be like for Lent and to instead to surrender one area of my life? One, uh, it might be time, it might be a relationship, it might be um, some financial thing, um, but to pick something, to surrender to Jesus' hand and say, Lord, your will be done, not mine, and then to act as though God is in control, knows what he's doing, and to try to do what he wants instead of what I want. So that is what I'm processing right now for what I'm going to give up. I haven't yet decided the particular thing, but I want to invite you into that adventure with me, and we'll see what kind of abundant life God might give us if we surrender this one thing into God's hands. Um, sound good? All right. Let's pray. God, thank you that your plans are better than our plans. And it is hard sometimes to trust you in the midst of not knowing what you will do. Um, but God, we do put ourselves in your hands as much as we are able. And um, Lord, guide us in these next few months to encounter you, to discover a more abundant life, and to discover what life can look like in your hands. Thanks for being good and loving and not always giving us the show we're looking for or doing the stuff we want because you have something better in mind. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.